most warm welcome to the session, the Global Economic Outlook. We're going to talk about the major trends and also especially um, how the economies worldwide will recover from the crisis and also the big topic of climate change, quantitative easing and where inflation is headed will be on our radar during the next 45 minutes. But before we start, we um, have a pre-recorded little speech or intervention by the Hungarian Foreign Minister Peter Sijarto um, about his change where we are in terms of economic recovery and also the challenges ahead. So take a listen and um, enjoy. It became very obvious last year that the uh, pandemic does not uh, only constitute a challenge regarding healthcare but a major challenge uh, regarding the economy uh, as well. Big companies, big and strong corporates were forced to scale down their production capacities. They were forced to shut down their operations and uh, waive uh, hundreds or even thousands uh, of their uh, employees. And now as the uh, market demand is picking up again, it became obvious that uh, there's no automatic procedure, no automatic uh, procedure for the downscaled uh, capacities uh, to be rebuilt, no automatic uh, procedure for the uh, lost jobs to be recreated, no automatic uh, procedure for the closed factories to open up again. Instead of all these, a, a new era, a new age, of global economy is kicking off. A new age which uh, is being started with a huge competition. A huge global competition uh, to redistribute the capacities of global economy. Now Hungary has uh, entered into this race with economic and healthcare related measures as well. We understood very well that those economies will be competitive in the future which can open up at the earliest time. And in order to be able to open up, we have to save the lives and the healthcare uh, situations of the people. And we can do it through vaccines. That's why the Hungarian government has never considered the vaccines as if they were of ideological or uh, geopolitical nature. But we have always looked at the vaccines as they are tools to save lives and uh, make steps back towards normality. On the other hand, those will be competitive who offer the best circumstances uh, for investors to locate or relocate their downscaled or closed capacities. Uh, Hungary has not uh, distributed basically any money on social basis during the crisis, but we have introduced and implemented a robust action plan to support companies to invest. Invest in technology to be upgraded and invest in capacity to be increased. The Hungarian government was ready to cover third or half, uh, depending on the stage of the expenses uh, of these investments in case the corporates uh, have committed not to, um, uh, not to uh, uh, bait, not to fire any of their um, um, employees. With this move, we were able to avoid the establishment of, uh, of robust and massive unemployment. Unemployment rate is uh, back to under 4% um, in Hungary. And while global trade has shrinked by more than 9%, we were able to increase our exports again up above 100 billion euros, with which we rank number 12 globally when it comes to uh, exports uh, compared to uh, GDP. So competitiveness uh, will depend on the uh, protected situation and uh, uh, protected situation and good healthcare situation uh, of the uh, people, and on the um, on the investment climate, which can be improved uh, through low tax rates. And Hungary, in this case, is still committed. We have the lowest tax rates of Europe when it comes to flat tax, both on personal income and corporate income. And we are committed to continue to decrease the tax burden on labor. We are ready 
for the new age, we are ready to compete and we are ready to be successful. So I take it up from there. Um, these are the words of the Hungarian foreign minister um, about his take on the economic outlook. Before we now start the discussion, I would like to encourage you uh, attendees of that session to also participate either through that function, uh, manage the mic, which is right on the bottom next to the mute sign, or while asking questions in that box on the right-hand side where it says comment or ask questions. So feel free to ask as much as possible. I'd love to, to at least try to have that session as interactive as possible. But now, first of all, um, I'd like to introduce or pass or yeah, sort of give the floor to the other panelists to say who they are. Perhaps we start with Barbara and Bernard, who is right next to me on the right-hand side of the screen. Thanks, Annette. I'm really looking forward to this session. So I am the founder and chief investment officer of Wincrest Capital, which is an asset management firm. Um, we run two funds, a global long short equity fund and an energy transition fund. So that's very interesting. Now over to you, Herman. Yeah, I'm Hemant Kanoria. I'm the chairman of Shrey Infrastructure Finance. We are basically a financial institution financing infrastructure projects for the last 31 years. So we invest in infrastructure. Primarily, we have been investing in India in roads, power, ports, and we have been a part of the development of infrastructure in private sector in India. Thank you. Great. Lisa? Hi there, uh, Lisa Edwards. I am president of Diligent Corporation, which is a software company that has the leading governance, risk, and compliance uh, software. And uh, and uh, we have about 25,000 uh, organizations around the world that use the software. So I come from more of a director angle. Okay, great. Um, let's start it from here. I mean, we've been hearing from the Hungarian foreign minister about his take on the economic outlook, and it seems that he is not overly, not super optimistic about the economic recovery. Um, what do you think, um, Barbara, and where we stand? Because clearly in the U.S., the, the numbers look really pretty stellar, right? Um, yeah, so, you know, we Company, countries are coming out of this in an uneven way. China recovered incredibly quickly, right? Travels back above pre-pandemic levels. The U.S. is now emerging very, very quickly. I mean, I was traveling last week and the airports are busy. Um, so, you know, what the minister was saying was how, you know, how he's using the vaccine and he was very positive on that. I agree. Of all the stimulus, it was interesting that Hungary was not doing stimulus. The vaccine is the most stimulative because that unleashes the animal spirits. And I think there's all this pent up demand we're seeing. So the question is, is this a sustainable trajectory in countries like the US or is this a, you know, a, this sort of the pop, if you will? Yeah, what's, what's your take here, perhaps, perhaps staying in the US, Lisa? Do you think it's like a pop or is that just a new level and we're growing from there? You know, it's interesting. So we do a monthly poll of uh, corporate directors and on public companies and get data from that. And we've actually seen that come down a bit. So whereas it was more optimistic uh, in the last couple of months, in the most recent one, we saw a greater number of both directors and CEOs uh, forecasting worsening conditions in 2022 uh, as compared to uh, how they felt about it before. And a majority of those um, last year had forecasted improving business conditions uh, by this time. Uh, but now that has gone down to less than 50% saying that they, they see improving conditions. Uh, there's about 30% that say they see potentially worsening conditions. And when they, when they're asked what drives those predictions, um, Typically, the, the most common cited factor is, is inflation. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I guess inflation is the biggest uh, yeah, uncertain event out there or the big elephant in the room right now. But, but yeah. perhaps we, we take a closer look also to another region of the world, from India, that you're in a completely different place than the U.S. right now. So um, how is your assessment of that recovery? And, and I mean, obviously, you're active worldwide, but perhaps we can have a look at the emerging market perspective. Yeah, so in India, basically the first wave, we had the lockdowns and all. And then after that, there seemed to be a very quick recovery in the last quarter. 
of the calendar year last year and also in the first quarter first couple of months it was going on well before we had the strike of the second wave and the second wave was really bad because we were just not prepared as a country because we thought that things were getting normalized and you know everything is getting hunky dory was fine and all of a sudden this second wave came in and the second wave was more virulent because they said that the variant which was here was the indian variant which was very virulent so therefore we saw massive deaths happening and people getting affected so i think that now the things have started coming down where uh, so we have india is a very large country so it's almost like a continent so in the first wave which we had last year there was a whole there was a lockdown in the whole country this year this time when it happened the central government the federal government decided that let each state take a poll depending upon that what is the issue at the local level at each of the state level and each state is also very large so we are one of the states which has a population of 200 million so you can imagine not very many countries also have that so it is it is quite a herculean task for the chief ministers or the governors of these states to manage the situation the health infrastructure also cracked up the hospitals the doctors nurses everywhere so you know it was but now things have started uh, easing up we have had huge number of vaccinations being administered to people on a regular basis so there are millions who are getting vaccinated on a daily basis even the mm-hmm. second uh, vaccination has been administered to a large number of population but still we have a long way to go so i think that uh, where the health infrastructure is concerned it has been uh, it has been a worry some kind of but things should be fine now and uh, economy also has therefore taken a setback last year the recovery which we were seeing in the last quarter of the financial year so this year again with the lockdowns and all i think mm-hmm. almost most of the industries will get affected so the government yeah. will have a task to control inflation also yeah inflation would be actually the the topic i'd like to move on now because clearly that's like the hottest topic in the markets uh, and it's a lot of discussion whether we are, this inflation is just yeah it, it's is it just a for this year and then it will recede again or will it have a lasting effect and what uh, what will it mean for monetary policy also going forward so i think baran um you have a, a view on on inflation and um the possible trajectory right Yeah so I don't think it's temporary I absolutely think it's here to stay and if you just look at the way inflation's measured it's a year on year number so for inflation to so you know if you look at anything let's just pick house prices that are up say you know double digit this year they would have to be down double digit next year for prices to come back to where they were and that's just not going to happen and so don't look at the cpi it's a dreadful measure of inflation think about something like that house that people are trying to buy unless your wage has also gone up you know double digit affordability has come down dramat- dramatically and inflation it's so important to focus on it because it's the hidden tax um and it doesn't it doesn't affect everyone equally it affects the poor far 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 more um so it's something that i focus on i also focus on what's the opportunity wherever there's a problem there's always an opportunity how do you monetize it and the thing that is most correlated to inflation is commodities and so if you can go long commodity producers there's i have the view that you can outrun inflation um but more specifically there are commodities that have a supply demand imbalance one of the things that's coming out of covid is governments are trying to stimulate their economies with these globally synchronized new green deals to green the grid and that puts tremendous pressure on copper and nickel and lithium and some of these rare earths their copper and nickel will literally be in deficit by 2025 the only way is up and um and there are wonderful way to monetize inflation in addition to that they're generationally cheap so when you find an asset that's generationally cheap with a catalyst um we get pretty excited Um Lisa is there anything from these director surveys you can add here and also the views perhaps from directors whether they are concerned about hiking interest rates and what monetary policy is doing 
Sure. You know, I think uh, we're seeing similar to to what Barbara Ann said. So first of all, um, there is certainly a concern about inflation and the effect on on performance and results. Um, that said, there's also um, in certain sectors, uh, you know, a thought that demand is actually on the rise in several sectors. So we saw, for example, a, a large increase in confidence in the healthcare sector, which shouldn't come really as a surprise, I suppose. Um, and that, that uh, you know, they attribute that confidence to pandemic recovery plus increased demand, people going back to getting back to former habits, actually going in for uh, elective surgeries and procedures. So um, so we do see to that to a certain extent. I would say in, in terms of the, the actual business environment, taking a side inflation actually slightly more bullish um, that um, but notwithstanding that sort of damper on it due to inflation. So, you know, I think it's it's um, the feeling is it's only a matter of time before business starts to reap the benefit of the vaccinations and, and the reopening of the states and, and these hard hit industries. Um, so we saw, for example, a director at an industrial corporation who, you know, really expects that um, that the situation will improve over the next couple of months. And, and he specifically cited um, reopening of the economy due to, to due to vaccine success and job growth. So, um, you know, we're looking at um, at job growth as well. Um, so it's sort of these um, potentially, you know, sort of um, from a from a confidence perspective and from a sentiment perspective, perspective, you've got uh, sort of the confidence of demand is increasing again, people are getting back out. Uh, but with the uh, with the qualifier that uh, inflation is is becoming more and more of a concern. I mean, is that different in where you are? I mean, you're active across the globe. So are you um, is there any <laughs> any um, strategy or any change in your business strategy given that outlook? Yeah, actually, basically, uh, you know, it is on the infrastructure side, things will pick up. But whereas many other industries will be struggling for quite some time, especially the hospitality industry is going to has suffered in India and many places in globe uh, globally. I think that Europe has been Again, one of the areas where hospitality industry has suffered, uh, India is definitely there. And I think it is going to take some time. In India also, we see the inflation rising because I don't know whether it is a global phenomenon, but we can see in India also because we used to have a lot of imports from China. So with the virus is starting, so there were restrictions on goods coming from China. So that will also create a lot of pressure on the uh, because the demand is is there. Be, okay. India being a large, Let but from the you, supply side, if you say you get you get uh, products from China, are you witnessing any bottlenecks when it comes to primary products? Because it seems that's the big thing for many industries right now. That's just not enough products at the right time. Yeah, so that is there. So that is why it will also trigger off inflation because the cost of the goods will go up because everything has to be available within the country and the imports will get constricted. And, you know, China was a very large, has been a large manufacturer in almost every product. And there would be restrictions of the Chinese goods moving, uh, flowing very easily, what it was happening earlier, whether it be India, Europe, US, everyone would have their own set of restrictions. So that is also going to, and we have not created enough manufacturing capacities in many of the countries akin to what China has been able to do. So I think that globally, we will see that there would be inflation in the next couple of years. And that would be one of the major concerns, especially for the poor people and especially those countries which have a large population of the poor people. There will be effect. The government will have to come out with, uh, you know, with SOPs and subsidies to be in a position to support that. The Indian government is doing it. But I think that many other governments will also have to follow as I see that even in the U.S., the government has, uh, you know, given a lot of subsidies and support to the people at large because of the job losses and with the COVID, yeah. and uh, which has also resulted in a lot of liquidity being there in many of the countries. Because we see that while the inflation is going up, the production has come down in India, the stock markets are booming. Yeah, it's and, not uh, in India, right? It's, it's, it's a worldwide <laughs> phenomenon. And and that um I'd love to build on something that Hammond said, which uh because I think it was important on uh, on supply chain. 
Um, and I think from an enterprise risk management perspective, many, many companies are having to rethink supply chain. They did not realize what would happen if whole segments of the world were cut off from them. So a supply chain that might have uh, optimized for cost uh, previously might now be optimized for flexibility. So this week it can make uh, one thing, next week it can make another thing. And sort of building that flexibility into the supply chain, I think is going to be a, a much broader phenomenon going forward for those companies that have to manufacture goods and certain goods. The uh, the, the other thing I think that, that it exposed specifically for the United States and, and Hemant uh, hit on this too, is that, you know, most manufacturing at this point in the United States has moved offshore. So when it came to, you know, we need to manufacture ventilators and masks, um, there is no manufacturing here. And, and that is something I think that, uh, that corporations aren't going to forget in the, in the short term, that, that there needs to be some method to, uh, to build flexibility into uh, both the factories, manufacturing, and the supply chain. Lauren, do you have a you here? Or? Because I you're not I, I have views on, on, I love everything everyone's saying. Um, so yes, the supply chain, we're seeing inflation there. The other thing is, you know, ESG is inflationary. For 40 years, we've been in a deflationary environment. You know, this um, global trade and outsourced, it, not in my backyard businesses to China, that's done. China cut a third of its steel capacity uh, two months ago because they didn't, they weren't green enough, right? So not in my backyard's coming to a neighborhood near you and that's inflationary. Um, so the other thing is, when you look at, I think it was the Chinese produce, produce PPI, um, yes. eight and a half percent. It was uh, yeah, it was yeah, literally yesterday, day before. Okay, so eight and a half percent inflation might not sound dramatic. You real, it's huge, and the reason it's huge is, you know, in in economics we have the rule of seven and ten, right? If you make seven percent a year, you double your money every ten years. Well, if inflation is seven percent a year. You have your money every 10 years, right? right. It's, so it's massive and people don't think about what that means. And um, and so the other thing is I was reading this article about, over the weekend about shrinkflation. When you go to buy coffee, coffee's up 50% year on year. Sugar's up 50% year on year, but you're not noticing because they're just shrinking the package a little bit and you buy it every few months, right? So um, it's it, it's creeping up everywhere. So it's not only in the supply chain, it, it's, in, it's in, your, you know, in your shopping cart. <laughs> But the key question is, is also what does it mean for the economic outlook and, and whether we think that central banks will come and really drastically high grades or whether what we've seen in their strategic reviews across the globe, I mean, starting with that, to be less vigilant on inflation. So what do you think will happen, Barbara? So they're more focused on the unemployment rate than they are yeah. in inflation, right? So we have a problem here. We have, um, we have record job openings and, an and a high un unemployment rate. So honestly, if I were the Fed, you get what you pay for. How about giving sign-on bonuses? Right? I mean, that's what Marriott's doing. That's what McDonald's is doing. The, the government needs to start, start, start doing it. This giving away money is, is not a sustainable solution. What it's also doing is really risking the reserve currency status of the U.S., and again, the economies that suffer the most here are the um, the emerging markets that are dollarized. So they're tied to this falling U.S. dollar with the inability to print themselves. How is that fair? So when you see four countries in 24 hours say they want to adopt Bitcoin, that is not a surprise. And that might be the first domino. And what are they saying? They're saying we this is we need a, a solution to inflation. Um, and, and maybe a currency that's outside of government's ability to print is it. And so this is a nascent, you know, it's a, a nascent market. And, um, but I absolutely understand their logic. Hmm. Yeah, that sounds drastic. I mean, um, at least here in Europe, it seems that people are moving away a little bit again from crypto because they're sort of afraid because there's so much volatility in that so-called asset. Um, but let, let us move on, on on one topic you briefly talked about. So, so Annette, Annette, what I would just add there is yeah. because we live in countries with stable currencies, yeah. we think it's very volatile. So you can say that Bitcoin's not a good store of value. The Argentina peso is not a good store of value either. That's true. <laughs> inflation, right? So Bitcoin's not about the first world in my mind. It's about a solution for the emerging economies 
that are being, you know, that, that have runaway inflation. Yeah. Um, so, and I, I'm not sure it's a perfect solution, but I, I understand why the countries that are saying, hey, let's take this seriously are saying that. And it's four yeah, countries yeah. in 24 yeah, that's hours. True. It's, it's Brazil's a, not small, right? You can say, oh, El Salvador, they're small. Yes, but, you know, when Brazil's, you know, so anyway. Uh, we'll yeah, no, 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 that's completely true. It's, it's, uh, it kind of depends on where where you're coming from, and the perspective is key here. Now, let me also bring up a, a topic which you also touch upon, and that's ESG and climate, because that will be after we are coming out of that crisis, of course, one of the big topics, perhaps for the next decades even. So, Roman, perhaps we, I would like to ask you, because clearly India is in a very different spot than the United States or Europe, um, how much of a topic is climate protection and climate change for a country like yours? So India has basically, you know, last many years, almost about a decade or so now, India has focused on the issues of climate change and the kind of capacity which has got created in renewable energy is just massive, whether it be wind or solar. And I think that we would be one of the leading countries now in the world where the installation, basically the government's ambitions are very clear. It's about 50 gigawatt going up to 75 gigawatt only on the solar. And then we have wind and renewable energy. So climate change, renewable energy is we don't see last seven, eight years. We have hardly seen power plants, new power plants which are coming, which are either coal based or gas fired or even oil. Yes, it's all renewable energy power plants which are coming up. So there are a lot of focus which is there on the climate change issues. Second part also, what India needs today in a big way is health infrastructure. So therefore, this would be another opportunity for companies both domestic and international but because it's such a huge population. And we have seen that with what has happened is that many of the places because of lack of health infrastructure, hospitals or doctors. So we'll have more of investments going into the health infrastructure. These are the two major opportunities which would be there in India. And also focus of the country has been on the climate change in a very, very big way. Uh, Lisa, uh, what are you uh, thinking about? These are like the big two major themes for the coming years. Yep. Yeah, so we're saying the same thing. I mean, Barbara Ann said it, you know, it's coming to a neighborhood near you, um, not just on uh, sort of the, the cost side, as she said, but but uh, what we have seen from uh, public boards of directors is increasingly, um, well, first of all, I should say they continue to remain on an enterprise risk management concerned about, um, particularly this year, cyber from some of the recent events um, and competition. But uh, ESG has ticked up the ranks on where uh, they feel they need better information, better reporting. And part of the reason for that is we're starting to see it get tied to compensation. So obviously, when you tie something to compensation, um, you've got to have a good benchmark and you've got to have good reporting on it or else... Uh, you know, there's a general sense of unfairness, uh, but there's so many standards out there. You know, are you using SASB? Are you using, um, you know, the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals? Are you using, you know, some other metric uh, or simply benchmarking against your own past? So there's general um, sense that, um, you know, we need to get our arm around the ESG issues. Um, and companies are increasingly saying we're talking about it. So we saw you know, 35% saying that they'd already tied some ESG metrics into executive compensation um, and executive goal setting. So um, it's it's definitely here to stay. Um, you know, I think there will be continued um, uh, kind of uh, machinations around how to actually put your arms around it and measure it. But but clearly, it, it remains of interest. Uh, Barbara, and we've been talking about like the decarbonization and all these major trends um, before when we spoke. So um, you have a very strong view on what it also means for um, earning money, right? For sorry, uh, for when when it kind of means for the major investment trends. Oh so yeah, the whole climate change and what. Yeah. So yeah. if you look at ESG, I mean, Lisa's absolutely right. It's definitely gaining traction. Today, $1 trillion is invested in ESG funds. There is $103 trillion 
committed to ESG if you look at the UN principles for responsible investing. So there's this tidal wave of money coming into ESG. So if there's that tidal wave, why are why is the solution why is it slow? Why is progress slow? And to put put this into perspective, Morgan Stanley says you need 50 trillion to uh, stop climate change, and that's 50 trillion invested in the technologies that can that, that can reduce carbon emissions. Um, so if 2x that has been committed, why aren't we seeing progress? And it's because most ESG money is passive, and most ESG index funds are index hugging, and they go slightly overweight tech, and they go slightly underweight energy. That is ESG 1.0, investing in the naturally low carbon emitters. That is neither profiting from nor participating in the transition. And getting more money to Facebook is not going to solve carbon neutrality. ESG is about investment, not divestment. And so what we need to do is get that money to the companies that really are changing the world. And how are they doing that? You have to look at where they're putting their CapEx. If they are making, we need the products, we need the services, right? We need them without the carbon. And that's investment. So when you can look at, let's take any number of companies in my own portfolio, let's take Foran, right? It's the first carbon neutral copper mine in the world. That's phenomenal, right? And so the, the, these are the companies that are changing the world. If you look at like Air Liquid and Lind, they're going to be providing all the hydrogen to the hydrogen cars and the ships. and the, So in my opinion, that's not only where the opportunity is, but it's also cheaper than paying tech multiples for companies that aren't participating in this. The tech thing, that's, not, that's nonsense. We need to go to ESG 2.0. It needs to be disrupted. And so the founder of SASB is actually my analyst on this fund. And she thinks she created a monster because these companies are investing in gaming her metrics and not in the transition. Um, so if you just have a high ESG score, right, with, and um, you are going to get that wall of ESG money, and that's not really the point. Or that's not going to help. That's not part of our solution. Um, so just people should be aware of, does your portfolio have purpose? Um, when we talk about climate change and also all these mega trends, how um, is India doing not only in terms of energy production, but um, also um, when it comes to embracing all these new technology like electrified vehicles, etc.? So I think that India has done a great job on that. Electrified vehicles, we are have seen almost a huge surge in the introduction of uh, EV vehicles everywhere. And also because from the perspective in India, which is important is one from the electric vehicles, definitely it is something which is needed. But we still have uh, in the country a large uh, unemployment rate. We have also poverty so therefore, the challenge for the government and everyone is to see that how do we bring up the people from the poverty levels still, and also from the perspective of unemployment, how to create more employment. So technology has been embraced very well in India. And through technology, as we see that large number of e-commerce companies and even in villages where people were not able to reach physically, so therefore, through technology now, it has there's broadband almost in every village in India now, connectivity. So people can access internet, people can access education programs. So therefore, you know, we ourselves in our uh, one of the group companies, we have about 140,000 centers in about seven, eight states in India, which are run by village level entrepreneurs. So where we provide services to almost about 55 million people in the villages. And we see that the way that they have been able to embrace technology is something which is just amazing. That even the level entrepreneurs, you don't have to teach them. You give them a contraption, you give them the connectivity, and they know how to do business. They know how to get people in the villages. Uh, so education, telemedicine, entertainment. So the way technology has spread all over the country, it is just amazing. And this has all happened in the last decade. And every year it keeps on increasing. So if we see also, we have a large number of unicorns coming out of India. So whether it is financial technology, whether payments which are being made, everything is digital. And also one way of looking at it is because we were latecomers. We in the villages, we were not able to reach. So with technology, we have been able to 
digitize the whole country much faster because we didn't have anything earlier. So therefore, people have been able to take that and it has gone into the villages. So that's I think that this has been transformational for our country. And uh, yeah. this, so therefore, from the perspective of education also, people are now used to the because schools are closed for the last one year almost. So every kid is now having classes virtually. So whether the person is, so whether in the village there is a good school or not, it doesn't make a difference because you can get good education sitting in a village also because as it is, it is virtual. Earlier you had to go to a physical school which was good school. So you could have the division of government schools, private schools, good schools, you know, normal schools. Now everyone can get the best of education virtually because as it is, the education is being imparted uh, through the technology platform. So I think that this is something which is uh, basically a big change in India, in our country. And also I see that many other emerging markets can embrace this uh, technological change and through technology, like telemedicine has taken place so well. I'm not talking about the urban centers, but, you know, villages where the reach was very difficult. And that is where it actually makes an impact to people. So when we talk about impact investments and all also, so these are places where people can actually reach. It impacts the life of lives of people, the employment which it creates because it creates more of entrepreneurs instead of people looking for jobs. They become entrepreneurs and they can in turn create employment. So like we run about 140,000 centers. So each of the centers, they employ about three to four people. So you can just imagine the massive transformation it has because of the employment it creates in the rural areas itself. People don't have to come to migrate to the urban areas. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> so that's like a positive change even stemming from the crisis we are witnessing. I mean, even in countries like where I am based in Germany, that forced digitalization um, upon us has changed things dramatically in the a right direction, but at least in a modern direction. So would you say that this digitalization as a trend is here to stay or are we done with it and uh, we move on in terms of like big topics, um, Barbara Ann? Yeah, so I think digitization is the big takeaway from this pandemic. And if you look at pandemics historically, there's always been some big change. Um, and I think this is the one that will define um, the COVID. It's absolutely here to stay. Um, and so again, the way I look at that is how do you monetize it? Um, and uh, so a lot of the tech companies last year, in my opinion, got really expensive. And that's because people were saying, it's the only thing I can buy. Like, um, capitalism is not based on zero sales assumptions. If a theater company is not open, there are no cash flows to value. How do I think about that? It's too hard, let's just buy Google. And so tech companies are great companies, but I think they brought forward so much demand last year um, that they're just, it's expensive. Um, yeah. I focused on ways to monetize digitization. Actually in Germany with a company called Zeros, which is the um, largest um, online, you know, a pharmacy, if you will. And my, and my thesis there was that was a company that could do well now and then. During the pandemic, people wanted to order pharmaceuticals online more than physically go, and it would be a beneficiary of digitization coming out of this. I paid one-time sales for that company. So the idea that you have to pay 11-time sales for you know, digitization is also crazy. Um, Lisa, let me ask you about um, your assessment here and also the what you think um, whether what what Corona or COVID uh, the, the crisis um, has uh, um, has changed the world or the, how we how we do business or how we work going forward because clearly you have access to all these directors. Sure, you know I I, I fundamentally agree that uh, you know digital transformation it really took a sort of a five-year acceleration. When you think about companies that had it sort of on the list to do, um, you know, we will get to it, all of a sudden had to um, really transform the way they operated. And there isn't, there's kind of no going back. Uh, you can't put the genie back in the bottle, but I think it does unlock things like 
um, you know, a workforce that is uh, potentially able to work more remotely. And those will have long lasting um, implications for the, you know, enterprise. And the other thing that I think the pandemic kind of created that was different in the C-suite and the boardroom was, um, you know, I think previously, if you'd asked about enterprise risk management to a board of directors or a CEO, you would not have gone back, um, you know, human capital management. Um, and, um, and, you know, we have to take care of our employees. But having to focus and pivot to mental health, employee health, well-being, um, how do we support uh, people who have to deal with child care, working from home, homeschooling, financial burdens of illness, mental health. Um, and it's really kind of been unprecedented that, um, you know, companies have had to deal with this. It's it's unprecedented that com- you know employees uh, have have their companies in their in essentially in their homes. So uh, thinking around new ways of considering risk management uh, and making sure that that is focused on employee health and wellness um, is is definitely a, 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 you know a very new thing for many uh, you know many in the C-suite. Uh, but it also appears to at least for you know for while the the pandemic lasts, um, uh, it certainly seems to be a part of what what companies have to take uh, into consideration now. Whereas before, uh, it was show up to work in the office and. And um, and we don't talk about all of that. Um, it is a, it's a market change of work from anywhere um, and focus on on employee mental health, um, you know, at home. Yeah. I mean, it seems that people uh, at least partially do li- really like this idea to stay at home or to at least at part and partially stay at home and work from home. Um, we have another five minutes roughly left um, for our panel. So I'd like to ask you about like, shortly what is on top of your agenda when you currently think about the economy, the economic outlook, where you're most concerned about and perhaps what you think will be the biggest also positive impact coming out from that crisis. Who would like to start? <laughs> I'll go. Um, You know, I think uh, I'll start with the negative. Uh, I think in the United States, uh, clearly the impact of unemployment and uh, financial burden of the pandemic has uh, has disproportionately affected women and people of color. Um, And that will take uh, potentially a long time to recover from with some of the issues that have come about like childcare and having to deal with that from home. So um, so I would say that would be uh, that would be, you know, one of the things I think will be a a, a long lasting issue. Um, But uh, this this, uh, you know, the trend toward digital transformation and ESG is clearly here to stay. And thinking through, you know, as Barbara Ann's put it very well, not just um, that, you know, companies that can check the box on uh, ESG metrics and measurements, um, but how do you tie real results uh, to ESG? How do you have, uh, you know, how do you consider your footprint in the world? Um, and increasingly, consumers are more sensitive to that as well. So how do we appeal to a new consumer set uh, that is going to take some of these things into consideration when they're making a buying decision? So I think all of those things are um, definitely here to stay with with post-pandemic. Barbaran? Um, I think Lisa put it, put it very beautifully, actually. Um, I, I agree with everything she said. Um, again, top of mind for me is inflation and you know, you, what you want to avoid is the companies with no inflation pass through rate. If you think about digitization and Amazon, um, what is that? It's just a price comparison website. So companies that are selling white goods have zero ability to, to increase costs, right? To increase price, yet their costs are going up materially. So they're on peak multiples and peak margins. Um, so I would stay away from, you know, the, the whirlpools of the world. Um, and do you want to go along the companies that do have high inflation pass through rates? Um, the, and to, you know, the other point is inflation creates inequality. So, um, as Lisa said, you know, inequality is going to be one of, one of the hallmarks of the pandemic as well. What you've had is inflation and asset prices and people with assets have really benefited. And those that didn't and are, you know, working, um, paycheck to paycheck are the ones who, um, 
who who really who really have suffered during the pandemic. Clement, the floor is yours. The final words. I, I think that basically, uh, you know, this has been very transformational because the world has seen a pandemic after hundred years almost. So therefore, you know, people had no memories because maybe that even my parents had not seen it. Maybe my it was my grandparents who had seen the last pandemic. So this time it was initially a big shock to people. And all over the world that I see is that both the lives and livelihoods, there has been a change that how people will be living their lives and how they had been living earlier. So the splurge which people have, I see at least many of my friends, many of the people known to me internationally, they have all started living more simply. So simplicity has come in in their personal lives. Health, people have become